they're problematic, they can be dangerous, and they're invasive. We're talking about species that we want to keep out of Alberta. So why am I on the side of the Yellowhead Highway east of Edmonton? We're going to get to that in a few minutes. First, I want to address the smoky conditions that we see today. The wildfire season has been terrible in Alberta, especially in and around Jasper National Park. That area is also where we find the first species we're talking about today. The mountain pine beetle. Is it, is it an invasive species to Alberta? Yes, so it is native to BC and parts of southern Alberta, but it's considered an invasive species in most of Alberta where it's not part of its native range. And it's expanding partly due to climate change and the temperature warming. And there's kind of a big problem here because the trees here haven't co-evolved with these beetles, so we don't actually know the extent of the damage that they could cause, which is why we consider them an invasive species. And you do, when you see the destruction that they have caused so far, it's scary to see that. And so what is it about the beetles that makes them so destructive? So the beetles normally are not that big of an issue. They attack weak and dying trees, but the problem comes during times of drought. Uh, then a lot of the trees are weak because they're just stressed from the drought, which means that the beetles can attack a huge amount of trees. And of course, when they attack these trees, uh, they often will die as a result of the process. And here in Alberta, we don't have a lot of trees that are resistant to them, so they could be potentially really bad pests here in the province. So what happens when they how do they attack trees? Like what's kind of their their MO? So when a mountain pine beetle finds a tree that they like, that they think is susceptible, they will start burrowing into the bark using their mouth parts to chew their way in. And then they release pheromones to attract a whole bunch of other beetles to attack the tree en masse. And what happens is the beetles, they burrow under the bark, they mate, they lay eggs, the larvae will burrow under there. It seems okay, but the problem is that they actually bring with them a fungus that grows inside the trees. And it's actually this fungus that's killing the trees. Not a question that I want to ask very often. However, what happens when this fungus gets into the trees and starts to take over it? Yeah, so the fungus grows inside these tunnels that the larvae are building, and the larvae actually eat the fungus for food. So it's they bring it with them as a source of food. The problem is that the fungus grows into the tree's vascular system, which means that the tree can no longer uptake water, and as a result, it basically dries out and dies. So then how do you know that a tree uh, has it has become fallen victim to the mountain pine beetle as opposed to you know, just reaching the end of its life. Yeah, so under the bark you can see galleries from the larvae, but of course that's kind of hidden most of the time. One of the things you will often see is pitch tubes. Around the little holes where they burrow, the tree will release a resin that we call pitch, and so often you can see that kind of on the outside. Now the real telltale sign is that the tops of the pine trees will become redder as the kind of they're not able to absorb water anymore, and so the very top of the canopy will start to turn red, and that's kind of a sign that it's already maybe a little too late but you know they're in the area. How likely is it that we're going to see more of the mountain pine beetle in Alberta? Because also like how do they travel? Like you're talking about how they burrow into trees but how do they get around too? So mountain pine beetle, they're not amazing flyers, but they do have wings. You can see they're very, very small. And uh, so they can fly and they can fly pretty decent distances if they catch a jet stream. People here at the university are studying that right now. Fortunately in Alberta, our cold winters tend to kill most of them off. So oftentimes they're not a problem. Of course, with climate change, that might change as well. Um, now, they're also attacking potentially new naive hosts, uh, different pine trees that don't exist in their native range, which again won't be resistant to those mountain pine beetles, so we don't know the kind of effects they might have on these naive host trees. There are, of course, a lot of other bark beetles out there, not just uh, mountain pine beetle, including other pine beetles, and a lot of them are not destructive. They might only attack dead trees. Uh, however, there is one that we do need to keep an eye out for, and that's the elm bark beetle, which can transmit Dutch elm disease, and that's one we're very concerned about in the city. Whenever we talk about this, I think, you know, you um, about the trees and how beautiful they are and how much they're a part of Alberta and, of course, across the, the country, really, and just to know that they can be so at risk is, it can be really scary. Thank you so much, Elena. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. So from one kind of pest that is all about dry conditions to our next one we're talking about, and they're all about bodies of water. I'm here with Nicole Kimmel. We are talking about zebra mussels. Okay, I have to confess, when I was a kid, 
I didn't hear about zebra mussels. When did they become a thing? So they, they came into Canada about the 1980s into the Great Lakes region and have been dominating uh, their presence in North America, especially on the eastern side of North America. We are now trying to protect Alberta's waters from getting them and they keep jumping provinces getting closer and closer. So these mussels have the ability to attach to any hard surface and actually stop water flow. So in Alberta, we have invested interest into our irrigation down in southern Alberta. So we are vastly concerned about this threat coming to Alberta because of that investment. But everyone stands to lose something if they come here to Alberta. And on that note, I know you have an example of what we're looking at here. Can you show yeah. us this? Because this really puts into perspective the risk that we're looking at. Yeah. So we have both examples of the invasive mussels here. We have quagga mussels on an ABS pipe and it has been allowed to be in the water for 18 months and you can see how heavily encrusted they are. They actually stack on top of each other. And if you look down the pipe, you can actually see that it actually is impeding that water flow through pipe systems. So if these mussels were to become heavily populated in Alberta, what cost are we looking at? So we've done some economic analysis and in 2013, which is already you know, getting to be 10 years ago, we figured about $75 million would be spent on the maintenance of all these infrastructure systems that use water with mussels. So we're here at the inspection station. When somebody has a watercraft, you inspect them. What, what does that entail? And how often do you actually find a zebra mussel or a, an invasive species mussel on a watercraft through here? When a boat comes through, we want them to stop for inspection because we don't know where they've been. They may harbor them and not know. So uh, we stop them, ask them a few quick risk questions based on where they've been in the last 30 days. And then we do a quick inspection and then they're sent on their way. We are seeing though that some are not stopping. So we have fines in place now and we've actually gotten the highest in North American fines. So if, an, if a watercraft was to cross through here without stopping, we can bring them back and actually issue them a $4,200 fine for not stopping at an open watercraft inspection station. Because we know if these were to get into Alberta, we would be spending millions in response. So we want folks to really take this threat seriously and we need their help to actually do the, the behaviors that we want to see folks doing in clean, drain and dry their boats when they come through. If all of a sudden you are inspecting and they, there is a muscle on there, what should people know about it? Uh, well, I mean, we'll clean their boat for free. That's why we have the Landa here right on site. We will clean it for free and remove that threat because we don't know where they're going from here. Even if they're going into a jurisdiction like BC, we try and protect each other through that level of prevention. Uh, to date, this year, we have 10 mussel fowl boats that we've intercepted at all of our stations in included, like all inclusive. Wow. Nicole, that's so interesting. I know that I've driven on this highway a number of times and I've seen so much about the zebra mussel. Now, as we're talking about being on this highway too, we're talking about going to Saskatchewan. I've taken this highway a lot of times. I've gone to Saskatchewan. It's where I first discovered the tick. And I thought, you know what? Thank gosh, we don't have ticks in Alberta. I was wrong. So ticks are quite common in Alberta, but not anywhere near as bad as say Nova Scotia, Ontario, uh, British Columbia. I would be far more concerned if I lived in those provinces. You need to learn about ticks so that you can recognize them right away. They are not like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are little fighter jets and they zip in, they suck your blood and they're gone. Ticks are kind of more lumbering like a dinosaur. So they're gonna be walking along you for a period of time before they actually attach. So if they don't attach, you don't have to worry. If they attach, that's when you have to worry. And even then, the sooner you get the tick off, the better. So if you can get it off within the first 15 minutes, half an hour, great. And if it went for like three days, I would be really super worried. The tick could fully engorge and you could have like a quite a swollen tick that would be very likely to transmit whatever diseases it had. So ticks carry viruses, Lyme disease and Bartonella. So ticks carry a real diversity of different types of diseases. But supposing I get home at the end of the day and I realize I have an attached tick. First thing I'm gonna do is go and get my tick removal kit. And if I have a tick on me, I can push the skin down 
because the skin would tend to swell up and I can then kind of scoop like that and then I'll pull out the tick will release but it's going to fall into that bottom part right there you don't want to like yank at this you don't want to twist it you don't want to do anything too sort of aggressive most people will say oh reach in with your fine pointed tweezers grab the mouth parts and then just put a little pressure on so it drops off what you're worried about is that pump the abdomen and that's because the blood is coming in it's getting circulated and then the tick is spitting through its saliva. It's spitting the fluid back into you. So that's when you really worry. So the sooner you stop that pumping action, the better it is for everybody. But you're still gonna be really at high alert for about 30 days. So for 30 days, if you get anything that suddenly you say, oh, I feel fluey, I feel achy, you're gonna say straight to the doctor. And you're gonna say, I was bitten by this tick. I'm really concerned. What I would do after I remove my tick, I would put it in a little Ziploc baggie and I'd write where I got the tick, the date I got the tick, all that kind of information, and then put it in my freezer because that way I can test it at any point. If I'm out walking my dog in the Edmonton River Valley, if the dog is walking in the middle of the path, I'm really not too worried. But how many dogs are actually gonna walk in the middle of the path? So after I take my dog for a walk, I would come in, I would pat my dog down, just in case there's a tick that hasn't even attached. But I would also be worried, especially if there's long hair on the dog, I would do a very careful tick check. And I would make sure that the next day too, if I'm patting my dog and I feel any kind of lump, I wouldn't ignore it. I would stop and I'd focus on that and see if it is actually an attached tick because that's actually most of the ticks that I get, uh, you know, in the, at the university, most of them are from dogs. So if you have a dog and you've removed the tick, then you want to call your vet. Don't get freaked out. As long as you know about ticks, you know about avoiding ticks, then you really don't need to get too worried. I know this just scratches the surface of the different creatures and pests and species that people are working so hard to keep out of our province or reduce the impact on our environment. I learned a lot and I hope you did too. I'm Nancy Carlson and thank you so much for watching.